Evolution. Evolution, by its definition, is the change in the characteristics of species over several generations and relies on the process of natural selection. While this is still a widely debated topic today, it was a crime during the early 1900s. In a court case called the Scopes Monkey Trial, an attempt to change the law regarding evolution and its discussion in school quickly became an epic battle between religion and science. While this case was a temporary victory for the Christian community of Dayton, Tennessee, it proves the impact and power of communication during judicial hearings. Ultimately, the communication implemented in this case showed how public opinion can sway the decision and how communication can be used to pursue others by exposing them to both sides of this argument. This is evolution. How communication affected the outcome of the Scopes Monkey Trial. There are many definitions and perspectives regarding evolution. My perspective is that evolution is when certain species develop into something new or extraordinary over time. For example, in the paleo period of mankind, we were cavemen. Over a long period of time, as a species, we've grown to be civilized human beings. That's evolution. We went from grunting and screaming to creating our own language and alphabet. From sticks and stones to airplanes and iPhones. Another example of evolution can be seen in modern birds. These animals descended from a group of two-legged dinosaurs known as theropods, whose more well-known members include the T-Rex and the smaller Velociraptors. While these concepts might not be difficult for us to grasp within the 21st century, back in the 1900s, mere mention of evolution within certain states was an outrageous crime bordering on heresy. Our story begins in 1925 and relies heavily on communication. But first, let's meet the cast of our show, and what a show it was. Darrow, a nationally renowned lawyer who became famous from his defense of the Leopold and Leop murder trial, will be cast as the defense lawyer. John Scopes, our protagonist science teacher who wants to allow his students to learn about Darwin's theory of evolution, will play our defendant. William Bryan Jennings, a three-time Democratic nominee for president and a deeply devoted deacon, will play our lead prosecutor. John T. Ralston will play the biased judge, and our jury will be played by a like-minded flock of fiercely faithful Baptists and Presbyterians. Now that you know our cast, let's set the stage of our play. In March 1925, the Tennessee legislator had passed the Butler Act, which declared the teaching of any doctrine denying the divine creation of man as taught by the Bible illegal. And no, I'm not talking about the how may I help you, lady, kind of Butler. On March 13, 1925, it made it a crime for any teacher in the public schools of Tennessee to teach any theory that denies the story of the divine creation of man as taught in the Bible, and to teach instead that um, man had descended from a lower order of animals. Uh, somehow, many of the men of religion in those days felt that uh, such an origin for man was destructive of the religious beliefs that were so vital in the life of many people. In 1925, John T. Scopes, a high school teacher, was accused of violating Tennessee's Butler Act. While Scopes himself allegedly claimed to have never taught the lesson regarding evolution, this trial still intentionally occurred. This trial was deliberately staged for two reasons. One, John Scopes' attempt to challenge the Butler Law so that evolution could be taught in public schools throughout Tennessee, and two, was Dayton's town officials' desire to attract publicity to the small town, which had a decrease in population and was facing economic concerns. With the help of the ACLU, American Civil U Liberties Union, he incriminated himself deliberately so the case could have a defendant on record. The objective was to overturn this law so that the study of evolution could take place in schools across the South. This was quite the goal at the time as the defendants was fighting an uphill battle in the America's Bible Belt. During the early 1700s, ministers traveled throughout the Southeast of the United States to spread Christianity. 
This period is often referred to as the Great Awakening. Farming communities in the southern states flocked towards these ministries and adopted their fire and brimstone approach to Christianity. This religion took root and spread throughout the South. The outcome of the minister's work resulted in an estimate of 75 to 80 percent of the population attending churches, which were built at a headlong pace. This strong devotion to religion sets the stage for a phenomenal trial. This ultimately made the case a challenge, as the public opinion had already established the victor long before the judge's gavel was even lifted. Our stage is set. So lights, camera, action. William Jennings Bryan, who was a quite well-respected figure on a national scale, agreed to be the lead prosecutor against Scopes. He claimed, like most in the state, that evolution was a lie that went against the word of the Lord. Clarence Darrow, represented the ACLU, agreed to be the defense. He claimed that Darwin's theory of evolution was a valid scientific study. Due to Darrow's success in the highly publicized Leopold and Leop murder trial and Bryan's high standing in the Southern society, the trial was sure to be a clash of the titans. The jury began on July 10th, and many were willing to take part of the spectacle, and on July 13th, the case began. Within the case, there were three important factors where communication led to the victory of the Christian majority. The first can be found within the trial transcripts, where Darrow humiliates Brian on stand when it asks if he believes everything in the Bible is literal. Listen to this segment of the transcript. You claim that everything in the Bible should be interpreted? I believe everything in the Bible should be accepted as it is given there. Some of the Bible is given illustratively. For instance, ye are the salt of the earth. I would not insist a man was actually salt or that he had the flesh of salt, but is used as salt as saving God's people. The Bible says Joshua commanded the sun to stay still for the purpose of lengthening the day, doesn't it? And you believe it? I do. Do you believe at the time that the entire sun went around the earth? No, I believe that the earth goes around the sun. Well, what do you think that the Bible itself says? Don't you know how it was arrived at? I never made a calculation. A calculation from what? I could not say. From the generations of man? I would not want to say that. What do you think? I do not think about things I don't think about. By contradicting the man, Darrow managed to imply that his arguments against evolution lacked merit. The second factor that led to the procreationism victory can be seen in how the town of Dayton communicated the trial. Again, being in the Bible Belt, the good book had such power within the community. Because this fine was challenged in the court, it gained a lot of local attention. This case was very much intentional, as it was designed to capture the community's attention, and boy did it work. The city's major used the trial to make money by advertising this event in newspapers and playing the trial on radio. The city made this quite the public scandal that everyone wanted to be a part of. They managed to sell hot dogs, lemonades, and popcorn to the crowds of people that observed the trial. Chimpanzees performed in sideshows, mocking the nature of the trial. They even used pages from the Bible to make stuffed monkeys to sell to the children. This performance was a family affair. This was the first case to be broadcasted on the radio. The use of the radio to communicate the information trial brought so much attention to the small town, people flocked to Dayton from all around to watch the show. The third and final factor that led to the anti-evolution victory was the certain striking of testimonies. After days of consistent back and forth, some key decisions had been made. Due to the public outcry communicating in favor of creationism, Judge Ralston made the choice to strike all scientists' testimonies from the record. While those listening at home managed to hear the accounts of the scientists, the removal of the perspective from the recorded transcript communicated who was going to win the case. By eliminating so many elements in favor of the prosecution, the defense 
had no chance of victory. The climax came on July 20th when Daryl called on Brian to testify as an expert witness for the prosecution on the Bible. In the trial's aftermath, Tennessee prevented the teaching of evolution in the classroom until the Butler Act was repelled in 1967, one year later. While it was a loss on the side of the scientists, Scope's trial increased American awareness and interest in the issue of teaching theology and our modern science in public schools. Though the debate over teaching evolution in American public schools still continues today, the Scope's trial proved to be highly influential in American culture. After the conclusion of the trial, Brian immediately began to prepare his closing statement as a man with high social standing in the community. He wanted the opportunity to leave a lasting impression and rub his victory in Darla's face. However, he never got to mock his opponent publicly or deliver that speech as Darrell decided to turn down the opportunity for a closing argument. This by law meant that Brian cannot turn in or conclude his argument. Six days later, Brian passed away using that speech since he died in his sleep. After the trial, Scopes was offered a new teaching contract but chose to leave Dayton and study theology at the University of Chicago Graduate School. He eventually became a petroleum engineer. The Scopes trial is a method of communication. It shows ways to communicate without being harsh or excuse anybody before reasoning it. It continues to attract inquiries and visitors from all over the United States and many parts of the world. The significance of the trial was officially recognized in 1977 by the uh, National Park Service.